We are talking about new opportunities in this new year. One of the great things that God has given to us is the calendar that changes, and uh, we begin to see the greatness. And this year, year that we have embarked upon, it brings with us many uncertainties. How many of you today can honestly tell me, I know exactly how the, the end of the year is going to happen? I know every problem I'm going to face. I know every possibility that God is going to give me. I'm going to use those possibilities and begin to uh, serve God in such a, a new, new way. And you might ask yourself the question, as we embark upon this year, ask yourself the question, am I moving in the right direction? Now, is, is it all coming in line? Is it beginning your life? Up until this point, is the framework starting to be centered in the proper manner? Or is it somehow moving in the wrong direction? Better yet, let me ask this. Am I moving in the direction that God wants me to? Now that's a little di bit different. Because let's face it, we as Christians, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to be moving in the way that God would have us to go. We are to be following Him. We are to be obeying Him. We are to be serving Him. And so when we begin to look at the concept of moving in the right direction, we need to ask ourselves, am I moving in that direction that God wants us to do? Starting something new allows you to do things you have never done before. We have all looked at our past and we say, well, you know, I've done a lot of things in my past, but when you have a new opportunity, you have an opportunity to do something you've never, ever done before. And what is it that God wants you to do? What is it that you have never done before that He's trying to get your attention and trying to get you to step out in faith? There is no better time for you to start than today. For some individuals, what God is calling you to do is God is calling you to, to come into the area of giving yourselves to Jesus Christ. That might be what God is wanting you to do. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Others, God might be trying to get you to step out in, in uncharted territories of beginning to learn new things and beginning to find ways to serve Him. And others, it is the opportunity of 2022 to find a way to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. What gives you confidence, what gives you peace, what gives you assurance in the midst of all the things that are happening. And so there's so many things that God could be calling you to do today. And we need to realize and we need to understand that each of us have this opportunity. So God's opportunity for you starts when? God's opportunity for you starts today. So understand this concept and begin to realize that He is trying to get us to follow Him. So God's opportunity for you starts today. Let's look at a couple passages of scriptures. We're going to be looking at these as the, the sermon progresses. We're going to be looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 uh, toward the end of the message. So let's look at this. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Bible conveys to us, it is looking back over chapter 11, which is all the spiritual giants or the individuals who lived and served God and were faithful to God. And then in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are all so compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, goes on, and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And what we begin to see is the concept here of Hebrews is beginning to allow us to understand we are in a race, but this race is not a, a sprint. You have a lot of people who join and, and they say they're going to serve Jesus Christ and they're running here and running there and lo and behold, they get burnt out. The Christian race is a long journey. It is to last from the day that you receive Jesus Christ to the day that Christ calls you home. 
You are to continue. You are to walk. You are to follow. You are to obey Him in all the aspects. So let's look at how our past regrets of last year, the year before, our mistakes that we made in the past, how our past regrets must be left behind. Now what he is writing, what the author is writing in Hebrews is he begins to say to us, you need to leave your past in the past. You cannot fully serve with full potential when you are dragging the baggage of yesteryears with you. None of us would go to a race, I don't care if you're the slowest person in town, none of us would go to a race in which we are carrying 50 pounds of baggage with us. And we get there on the starting line and we got that extra 50 pounds of weight with us and we start out to run. That would be foolish. We need to somehow leave it behind. We need to set it behind in this process. We need to uh, walk away from it. We need to deal with it and walk away from it. And Scripture gives us that opportunity to deal with it. It says that we need to let it there. Uh, we need to look at what it says. We need to run with patience that the race that is set before us as individuals. We need to fulfill the purpose that God has given us, and we can't fulfill it when we're dragging the yesteryears with us. Get rid of the past. Deal with the past. So many people cannot live in the presence of what God wants them to do because they're holding on to something that's happened in the past. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, even some family members have had a history 50 years and they're still holding on to something that happened. And when you talk to them, many of them cannot even realize what is going on, what basically has happened, what caused this rift or this break between our relationship. So we need to understand three things I want to deal with in regards to our past. I want to uh, address this. First of all, in looking at our past that we need to leave it behind, number one is you cannot undo the past. The past cannot be undone. You can ignore it, but other people don't, do they? You can try to sweep it under the rug, but obviously if you sweep it under the rug, what does that do to the rug? It makes a bump in it. And so we get this concept of where we need to realize your past cannot be undone. Now I want you to, to just imagine for a moment. Imagine that you was the one that God created first. You was the first man and the first woman. Now remember that the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, they did something that they shouldn't have done. They disobeyed God. Okay, When they disobeyed God, there were consequences that were brought upon them. Now what God did, because of their disobedience, because of the sin that they committed, they were cast out of the garden. Did you know that? Now, being cast out of the garden didn't mean that they could not look back and see the garden. So look at Adam and Eve, if you was them, and you're looking back and you see and you're focusing upon what you did, your disobedience, and how you realize, I can't undo my past. So if we realize we can't undo our past, and only when you realize you can't undo your past is when you can start in the progression of moving forward. So you cannot, none of us can undo the past, the mistakes that we've made or whatever we've done. Uh, they constantly look back and we begin to see the problem that they faced. And going on, we begin to realize, secondly, that you, 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 uh, the weight that comes upon us it, you, you can't win, you can't run, you can't uh, fulfill your purpose because of the past has a tendency to weigh you down. Your past will always weigh you down. When you meet people who you have never known, they hear something about your past and the first thing that comes into their mind is what they've heard about you, whether it's true or not. They make judgments based upon what they've heard about you. 
And that is where our past had, has a tendency to weigh us down, is to hold us down in this grasp. And that's why uh, we find here in Hebrews that says we've got to do something about the things that are weighing us down. And then he specifies the th not only the things that are weighing that us down, but you need to get rid of the sin in your life. So there are things in our past that we need to get rid of and some of the ways that we need to get rid of them we're not willing to do because often it involves us going to somebody and asking for an apology or asking for them to forgive us. We don't want to do that. And so it's weighing you down in this new year. It's holding you back. And when we begin to realize that our past regrets keep us in bondage, and the devil rejoices over that. So the author says, get rid of them. So we get rid of them. And that is the concept of what we can see. The third thing that we can understand is that these past regrets have the ability to keep us out of God's will. Your past sins, that's the breakdown. You're talking about get rid of the weights, all these things that have gone on in your past. Get rid of them out of your life. And he says, and the sin which does so easily beset us. Sin gets into your life very easily. We sometimes think, well, you know, sin knocks on the door and says, hey, let me in, let me in. No. Sin has a way just to slip in. And we sometimes don't even notice it until it's in our lives. But it is that sin that can keep us out of God's will. It is the concept of saying, well, I have sinned and God can't forgive me. People, listen to me. There is no one God can't forgive. If the person is willing to turn from their sins, he, he is faithful and just to forgive their sins. There is the need for us to turn from the past into the present, to deal with the things. So let's look at the, the next concept. In Philippians chapter 3, this is Paul's advice, and it's advice to us as individuals. He's dealing with things that we should be doing and striving to do in our lives, beginning with verse 13 of, of Philippians chapter 3. This is the concept. We need to live in the present, not the past. We need to live in the present, not the future. Our present determines our future. Our past does not determine your future. You got that? It is the concept of what you're doing today which is determining your future, not what you did yesterday. It's what you do today that begins to make a difference in your life forevermore. So we are to live in the presence. Philippians chapter 3, go with me down to verse 13. Behold, brethren, I count myself, uh, he says, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, he says, forgetting those things which are behind. You got it? We need to leave the past in the past. So this is the concept of living the present, we need to put those things in the past. And he says that we as individuals, not only are to forget those things which are behind, but we need to reach forth unto those things which are before, okay? And when do you reach on the things which are before? You reach on them in today. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow hasn't come. You reach it in the process of daily living for Jesus Christ. There is a phrase, some of you, I know this phrase, but I've also put the, the uh, phrase that you'll remember and probably know better. There's a phrase, a word, carpe diem. And what that means, if you do not know, it means that you need to cease the day. I've got it right there so you can begin to see it. It is carpe diem. And that is that concept, and this was something that was uh, written by an individual, a poet, a horse, more than 2,000 years ago. This has been a statement that has been used and abused in so many different ways, but it is a profound statement. It is a statement that means just that, that you and I as individual reminds us that every moment matters. You can't stay in the past. It's about what you're doing today. You need to seize the day. 
You need to get up in the morning and say, God, this is the day I claim your victory. We get up in the morning, we don't claim nothing, and we're already stepping out in the area we're going to be defeated. <coughs> claim the victory of God. And understand that the most significant part of your life aren't always the big achievements, but it's the little things you did that led you along the way. Each opportunity that God gives you is an opportunity to move forward. Those little nameless acts of kindness in love speak volumes. So cease the day. So how do we really cease the day? How do we live in the present? How do we somehow get our focus upon the past and wrapped up in the future of what you're going to have when you retire? My prayer is none of us ever retire. That we all, especially in our relationship with Jesus Christ, keep working to the day that God calls us home. What a glory that'll be. So how do we do that? How do we carpe diem? Number two in this area, we need to make wise decisions. Now I venture to ask, well, I'll go ahead and ask. Have you ever made an unwise decision? Now don't look to your neighbor and say, well, I have. Don't blame somebody else. Have you ever made an unwise decision? And what we've got to do is we've got to start making wise decisions. And the area of making wise decisions, we often will reach out to many books out there that will teach us the ways of investing, and that'll uh, bring us in the right direction. Did you know the Bible, the Word of God, is the best book for financial direction? God says, seek me first. And I will add all these things that you have need of. You know what people are doing? They're seeking God last. So we need to make wise decisions. We need to say, Lord, I need to make a wise decision today. I need to make a decision that will move me in the right direction. And the way that we make wise decisions is that we as individuals, we need to learn more about God and we need to learn more about God daily. Are you studying about God? We study life, we live life, but yet the maker of life, we somehow, we throw him aside and we say, I can do it all without God's help. Truth is, you can't do it without God. If God didn't exist, he people, you know, we, we sometimes fail to realize, if God didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. You say, well, he started things back then, but he's just not actively involved. Listen, people, if God didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to breathe. You see, we're dependent upon God, and we need to learn more about God. We need to be uh, in God's Word and studying God's Word and finding how God's Word is speaking and God's Word is, 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 is causing us to serve Him in such a great way. So we need to learn more about God. I'm here to tell you something. The more you study about God, the more you need to know about God. God is one of those things that you can study and study and study and study and you can think you understand God completely. The truth is you can't. We try to put God in our framework. We try to say this is what God is like. But then God does something that breaks that mold. And God can do that because He's God. And I'm not, nor are you. So we need to learn more about, about uh, God daily. Uh, number four is we need to love more like Jesus Christ. What a difference this year would be if we started loving more like Jesus Christ. We need more of Christ's love. And where is Christ's love going to come from? It's not going to come from the world. The love of Christ is going to come from the body of Christ. And who is the body of Christ? We are. You. Me. 
People who have received Jesus Christ, we need to love more like Jesus Christ. We need to find a way to love more. Well, by to love people who do me wrong? Well, what did Jesus do? Jesus loved even the ones who nailed him on the cross, which that's us, not just the Roman soldiers. Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them. Hard words. But what we need in the area of the new opportunity, of new year, is we need to love more like, we need to cease the day. We need to carpe diem, and we need to start loving people more like Christ loves us. Number five is just basically a look back on the carpe diem is that you need to make each moment count. If I asked you to chart your daily events and you began to chart everything that went on that day, did you make each moment count? Now, what I'm talking about is not count for you, but count for God. Because truly, God is the giver of all things. And the more we serve God, the more God blesses us. Now, I'm not saying that He's going to give you a boo koodles amount of money. I'm not saying that. But I'm here to say, you, say to you that you cannot, cannot outgive what God has already given for us, to us, and will give to us. How much is heaven worth? Well, I guess the true way to get an understanding of that is to be dangled over the pits of hell. Because in the pits of hell, as Jesus conveyed about Lazarus and the rich man, in the pits of hell, the individual who was rich in this life asked for Lazarus just to give him a drop of water. How much is heaven worth? Cease each moment. Make each moment count. Now I want to give you an illustration, a biblical illustration in regards to this. Re uh, Moses is an individual who reminds us of all these truths that we kind of mentioned here. All these truths are found in the life of Moses. We understand that Moses, he looks back over his life and Moses had a life of regrets. What did he regret? Well, he regretted getting found out that he murdered somebody. I mean, think about it. He, he's serving as a, a royal ambassador, not an oral ambassador, but a royalty, and yet he did something horrific. He killed somebody. And it was found out. He was okay with the hidden sin. But did you know that you can't keep sin hidden? Sin will always find a way to come out. And well, it came out, and Moses fled. He was 40 years of age, and he fled Egypt. He gets out of Egypt. He gets out of Dodge, if you want to use that expression. He runs for his life. So he's out in the wilderness, and he has the regrets of what he did in his past. And when he looks at his past, he realizes, I can't unkill that person. And what happens is he spends time, the second aspect is he spends time with God. One of the best times to spend with God is when you're all alone, when you're in the wilderness. Find your wilderness, find a place where you can get alone with God. And when you get alone with God, God begins to speak. Turn off the radio. Lock the door, go outside. Get in a cardboard box somehow. Get in a place that you will listen to God, spend time with God. If you want, the best thing to do is keep your mouth shut and listen to God. Forty years. Moses out there with the bay and the sheep, the wilderness, the sky, the splendor of heaven, and he spends time with God. And then we know that his life was changed there at the burning bush experience. Something happened. God got his attention. And it is in that wilderness experience that he had that he begins to understand that there is something greater than my past regrets. There is the present. And God says, 
through the burning bush, Moses, and Moses says, I've got to see what's going on. And he goes into the presence of the burning bush. And it is at that point that Moses ceased the day for God. You see, we've been living for so many years and we've been living for ourselves. But it's when you have that burning bush experience, maybe you don't see the burning bush, but you see that God's burning in your heart, in your life. And it's at that point that He changes our lives. And it is at that point that His life was changed and it caused Him to seize the day. His life was changed at the burning bush. And what He did from that point on is He seized the opportunity to be used of God. Now, he could have went back well before that, but it was at the point of the burning bush that he says, God has something for me to do. I will obey God. I will cease the day. I will claim the day. And not only will I claim the day, but I will take this day and I will live in accordance to his way, his will, and I will obey him no matter who does. And we know the story that he went back. And how long did he have to seize the days? 40 years. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years as a shepherd out there in the wilderness meets God. At 80 years of age, God speaks to him in a way through the burning bush that Moses realized. And at that moment, he ceased the days from there on out for the glory of God. 40 more years. Forty years dealing with stubborn mankind. Boy, that's a long time. But let me say this. God has been dealing with some people longer than 40 years. And He's still waiting. He's still dealing. He's still dealing. And He's waiting for them to just cease the day. Take advantage of the opportunity and began to give them their lives over to Him. Now when you look at 2 Corinthians, it's a passage that Paul writes and he encourages us in this concept. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation, I have secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And what this allows us to realize is that your opportunity is today. It's not in the past. It's not in the future. But your opportunity is point blank today. It is the concept of realizing that you can't go back in the past and accept Jesus Christ, but you can do so in the present. You can't uh, uh, wait till tomorrow because we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. You must make it right in the present. So if you want this year to be the best year ever, it comes to the point of saying, what am I going to do? Am I going to commit my life to Jesus Christ? Am I going to listen to what he is saying? Am I going to obey him and allow the remainder of my life to be such a, a glorious time that I will radiate the glow of God Almighty? Isn't that what Moses did? Many people look back on their lives and they look back with regret. What we must do is to realize that God has given you an opportunity. You're here today. God's given you an opportunity. And that opportunity that He's given to you is a new one. 
And he's basically doing this to allow you to realize that you're not too young or you're not too old to make this opportunity and to use this opportunity and to step out in faith. That's what it's going to take in this year. If we're going to see the church alive and changing the lives of individuals, it's going to take us stepping out in faith. It's going to take us living like Christ lived, loving people, forgiving people, doing whatever God would call us to do. And I ask this, what is God calling you to do today? What is God calling you to do today? You see, He's probably called you in the past and you wouldn't answer. You put it off. You put it off. But people, each of us, are getting closer to the finality of our life. And we may put it off one moment too long. So what is God calling you, 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 to do today? Is God saying, oh, don't do nothing. No, he's not calling you to do nothing. But God's calling us to use the talents that he's given us in order to help other people see Christ in us. What's in your framework for God? Let's pray.